may be seated. Now we're back in the book of Acts. We've been kind of all over. We're back here in Acts of the early church members studying them. And we come to Peter and the two miracles that he performs here in Acts chapter 9 uh, in the power, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ. One was the healing of a man, Aeneas, who had been eight years sick with paralysis. And the Bible says he also had the raising of Tabitha or Dorcas from the dead. Now, when we think of Peter up to this point in the book of Acts, we think of him in more of a public ministry. When you look at how he preached to the same folks that had crucified the Lord there in Acts chapter 2, and he's preaching to Israel with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. And we look at, at, at the miracle that he performed there in Acts chapter 4, coming up to the temple when he says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. These great public miracles. But now we find more of a private ministry, a very personal ministry that Peter is doing here for the, pretty much the first time. We don't really count the case of Ananias and Sapphira there in the church in Acts chapter 5 as being a, a good miracle. Amen. Dropping dead. Amen. Joppa, that should call to your attention. That city is important. Look over in the book of Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1, I find it significant that Jonah was called by the Lord. Look at verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. This was a Gentile city. God had called Jonah to go preach unto the Gentiles. This is important. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down to it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I, I, I hope I heard music and you heard it too. Either that or I'm hearing things. Amen. This is not a good start. Amen. Everybody look at their phones. Turn them off. Amen. Jonah went to Joppa to avoid going to the Gentiles. And yet we find Peter in Joppa and there he will see the great vision that the Lord gives to him that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is to go to the Gentiles. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. If you'll remember, God sent a storm because Jonah disobeyed God. But here, Peter will go to Joppa. And there he will receive word to go into the Gentiles where there will be, be, be the preaching of peace and joy. What a contrast. And so here in the book of Acts chapter 9, we meet another wonderful church member just serving the Lord in the early church. Her name is Tabitha. She was, I believe, what we're going to study, in effect, everything, the personification, if you will, of what a Christian should be. If you'll notice here in the text, the Bible says there was a certain disciple named Tabitha. I find that interesting. I find that it is the only time in the early church where a woman is specifically called a disciple. And she was just such a marvelous woman in these few, few verses that we understand why she gets that distinction. Her Greek name was Dorcas, which I, again, find interesting because Peter is about to get the vision to go from the Jews to the Greek. And so Dorcas is the first Greek name, Greek female in the New Testament. The church is, of course, pictured as a wife. Isn't that something? The Gentiles. Wow. So in the purest sense, she is everything I believe that a Christian should be. We're going to find this. She's fulfilling what God has called her to do by being a church member. What do we find about her that's different? Well, I believe we're going to find in this paragraph that Tabitha made a lasting impact on her church. And if we desire to make an impact in our church, then we are going to study and be mindful of her example. And I want you to see here in the text... How can we make a lasting impact on our church? How can we make a lasting impact on our church? I want you to see number one, I mean, this is not a, a deep outline at all, but it's so important for us to see 
the impact that we are called to make in the local church. I want you to see, how can we make a lasting impact? Number one, by our walk. By our walk. Would you look at verse number 36? Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation called Dorcas. I believe that it is significant that we find her Hebrew name, Tabitha, and her Greek name, Dorcas. I believe that it's very clear that in the early church, she is ministering and is well known by not only the Jews, but also the Greeks. I think that that is important because if you'll remember over there in the book of Acts chapter 6, there was a, the first division that was taking place in the early church. Do you remember that some widows were being taken care of, but others were not? Here, Tabitha, Dorcas, is taking care of everybody exactly like Acts chapter 6 said she was supposed to do. The word Dorcas, the name Dorcas means a gazelle or a deer. I think that that's significant. One commentator said it this way. The gazelle is distinguished for its slender and beautiful form, its graceful movements, and its soft but brilliant eyes. It is frequently introduced by the Hebrews and other Oriental nations as an image of female loveliness. And the name was often employed as a proper name in the case of female. Hey, have you ever thought to yourself, I know that it's spelled differently. But have you ever thought that a great term of endearment that we even use in the English language is when we call someone dear? Isn't that something? They are dear to me. Isn't that striking? Though we have studied this many times, as we have established here in the church, and I can't wait to begin in January again, our discipleship ministry, we need to understand what a disciple really is. A certain disciple named Tabitha. A disciple's purpose is to become more like Jesus. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 40 says, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be his master. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 29 says, But whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. The two times in the book of Romans, we are told to conform to something. We are told not to conform to something else. We are told to conform to the image of the Son of God. We are told not to conform to the world. Amen. Notice the Bible says to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what a disciple is supposed to be. All Christians are not disciples. There's a lot of saved people and they're going to heaven, but as Paul said, so as by fire. You'll get there just by trusting Christ and His faith as your faith by believing in the grace of God, by receiving that free gift of salvation. But make no mistake, that doesn't make you a disciple. A disciple involves a conscious decision to want to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. Amen. What a disciple is described in Scripture can be remembered by the acrostic disciple, D-I-S-C-I-P-L-E. If you'd like to write this down, I'd encourage you to. What is a disciple? Then you can look at those and say, am I a disciple? The D, we say, denies self. A disciple denies self. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do you already see how not every Christian is a disciple? Because there's a lot of Christians today that refuse to take up their cross and follow the Lord. There's a lot of Christians today that don't want any of the hard stuff. They'll just take the easy way. You can't drift into becoming a disciple. It's a decision. It is a daily denying of your flesh to follow Christ. The Bible says, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. But he also said that we must die daily. We must reckon ourselves dead. It is a daily decision. We have to reckon ourselves dead. According to Romans 6.11, we deny self. The I would stand for immediately forsakes. Immediately forsakes. A disciple immediately forsakes anything that would come in the way of them being conformed to the image of the Son of God. The Bible says over there in Luke chapter 14 and verse number 26, If a man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now listen, this verse doesn't give you license. 
Well, man, the Bible says I got to hate my wife. No problem there. Amen. The Bible says I got to hate my in-laws. No worries. That's not what this verse says at all. Nice try. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 37 is the best commentary on this verse. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible doesn't say you can't love your wife, but the Bible does say you can't love your wife more than Jesus. Amen. Sorry. Listen, your kids, they're important to you in your life, and they're great and they're good, but you don't love them over Christ. Y'all with me today? Amen. So the Bible makes it very clear. You're willing to immediately forsake any relationship that keeps you from conforming to the image of the Son of God. Are y'all with me today? Are you, are you, you're not going to like this statement. Nobody, nobody, no relationship in your life should come between you and doing what the Lord has called you to do. Yeah. All right? That's not being a good Christian. All right? Amen. A disciple is one who immediately forsakes. The S stands for surrenders worldly pleasures. Disciple is one who denies self, immediately forsakes, and surrenders worldly pleasures. Luke chapter 14, 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciples. In other words, a disciple doesn't cherish worldly possessions that he gets from the world. He just does his best to provide what he can for his family and to be content in what he has and not allow the pleasures of life to come between him and his Lord. That's what we're talking about. Not saying you can't enjoy the... We know that every good and every perfect gift comes from above. But those things that God gives you, we can begin to worship the creature rather than the creator. Y'all with me today? Then he carries his cross. See, he denies self, he immediately forsakes, he surrenders worldly pleasures, and he carries his cross. I like that. When a, when a crucified victim would be crucified, he would have to carry his cross because of guilt and shame, which is interesting that the Lord Jesus, somebody else carried his cross, at least part of the way. A great picture there. Remember, he became sin for us. That's why part of the way, Simon of Cyrene carried Christ's cross. Wow. But the Bible says we have to be willing to say, you know what? I'm guilty and I'm nothing without the Lord. Carry your cross. Oh, yes. I'm nothing without him. I am guilty. I'm on my way to a, to a everlasting torment without the Lord Jesus Christ. Carries his cross. It's not always going to be easy. Luke chapter 14 verse 27 says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Galatians 5 24 says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lusts. Letter I, another I, denies self, immediately forsakes, surrenders worldly pleasures, carries his cross, and then another I increases their fruit increases their fruit. We are growing into maturity so that we might be able to develop the fruit of the Spirit that we might be a testimony to the world. The Bible says in John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Do you understand today that not everybody is, that is saved bears fruit for the Lord? They don't have anything to show for it. You shall know them by their fruits. Some, some Christians, you can't even tell if they're saved. Right? We know that it's an apple tree if it produces apples. We know it's a vine tree if it produces grapes. We know that it's a banana tree if it produces bananas. We know that it's an orange tree if it produces oranges. I can keep going. Right? We know them by their fruits. A disciple replaces, as, as we find in the book of Galatians, the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. A, dis a disciple does not produce his own fruit. Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He bears the fruit of the vine. And then our P, a disciple pursues a deeper knowledge of God's Word. A disciple pursues a deeper knowledge of God's Word. John chapter 8 and verse number 31, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. That was easy, wasn't it? And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. See, and we're going to find this a little bit later. It is interesting that, that Tabitha is called Dorcas. It is interesting that the Bible says a disciple longs to know God's word more and more and proves it by actually getting their life in the book. 
And then our L, a disciple loves other believers. Uh, Y'all were almost there, weren't you? L, loves other believers. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The same love. Listen, when you read the Gospels, do you remember when we studied verse by verse in the book of Mark? Well, those disciples were frustrating. All those times that Jesus had to contend with their unbelief, their doubt. One of them turned on him. One of them denied him. Uh, no, they all forsook him and fled in the garden. But notice the Bible says that he loved them. I love that after his resurrection, Peter, the only thing he knew left to do was he, he knew to, to just go fishing. He said, I go a fishing. And, everybody, and, and his disciples went with him. The Bible says that there Jesus was on the shore. Waiting for him. He pursued them. Even though it was Peter that should have been the one to reconcile himself with the Lord. It was Jesus who loved Peter so much. He gave him the ministry of reconciliation. That's what a disciple does. A disciple is so mature and so comfortable in his walk with God that he loves other believers. Whether he gets that love returned to them or not. I got to breathe. I haven't been breathing for the past 10 minutes. This is exciting. Can you tell... That our church, we have a passion for discipleship. Amen. And then I want you to see our E. A disciple evangelizes. A disciple tells other people about Christ. Amen. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Well, look at this. But some doubted. See? And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I love that King James Bible word, always, instead of always, that most modern versions uh, would change that to. He tells the disciples, You will not have me with you always. But he says here, And lo, I am with you always. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know the difference between always and always. Sometimes we don't have the ways that we can see to rejoice. We don't see the Lord Jesus face to face, but we know He is with us always. Isn't that wonderful? We don't always see ways in which we can rejoice, but we know to rejoice in the Lord always. That's amazing. The things we cannot see. So when Tabitha is called a disciple specifically. We know that a disciple is more, ah, just a certain disciple. No, no, no. She's a disciple of the Lord. That means something according to God's word. Look over in Luke chapter 9 and verse number 23. We find that biblical commitment to discipleship in five things right here in this one verse. I want you to see, first of all, it takes a desire, if any man... Secondly, it takes a decision. Will come after me. Thirdly, it takes a denial. Let him deny himself. Fourthly, it takes dedication. Take up his cross daily. And I want you to see, finally, it takes determination. And follow me. You can't just fall backwards into discipleship. It takes a desire, a decision, a denial, a dedication, and determination. When the Bible calls specifically Tabitha a disciple, we now know what we're talking about. Notice her impact in the church. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation called Dorcas. Everybody knew the impact Tabitha Dorcas was making in the church because she was a Disciple, Her impact by her life, by her walk with both Jews and Gentiles. Remember, we said that Dorcas means a gazelle or a deer. We think about a disciple. It reminded me over there in the book of Psalms 42 and verse number one, it says this, as the heart, and the heart is a deer, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. That is Tabitha. They would have never included the fact that she was a disciple if she did not make an impact in that way to the church. Talking about impact in the church, last Wednesday night, I was told in children's church that the kids were practicing a song. 
And they were all up there singing around and having a good time. And they were working on stuff, I guess, for Christmas. And uh, Abraham was in there. He was singing. He was playing with his hands like this. And then he started pointing. And then he went to the next finger. And he figured out how to hold up his middle finger. And so he's going around all the kids. Hey, look what I can do. That was an impact on the church. Amen. <laughs> he didn't know. I, I thought maybe that that's what he had seen his mama do when I had my back turned. But that's. <laughs> he denied it. So uh, I don't know. How, <laughs> how can we make a lasting impact? Well, Abraham certainly has here. How can we make a lasting impact on our church by our walk? I want you to see secondly by our works. By our works. By the things that we do for the church. Would you notice here in the text, once again, it was a job of a certain disciple. We know what a disciple is. This woman was full, full of good works. Wow. And alms deeds, which she did. We talk about alms deeds. Well, the Bible defines what that is. We're talking about giving of her substance to people that are less fortunate. That's over there in the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse number 41. But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. So something out of her, what she has to bless someone else with, that's her alms deeds that she did in the early church. Notice that she was full of good works. And I looked at that full, and I thought about how many times... Paul tells us to be full and filled with things. Over there in the book of Romans chapter 15, in verse number 14, it says, And I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 19, the Bible says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 11, the Bible says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ under the glory and praise of God. So we understand the context of that word full or filled by looking at other portions of Scripture. And so we look at that in, in, in the life of Tabitha. We find that she was full of good works. In other words, what she said she believed on the inside showed up on the outside. What a concept. I believe that in this paragraph, she is the personification of what a Christian should be, what a Christian is designed to be. She is the spiritual example, I believe, for everybody today. And this is just in the introduction of what we've seen of this woman in the first verse. She was a disciple of the Lord, and she proved it by her outward actions. Amen. We don't know much about her other than this paragraph. As a matter of fact, we don't find anything else about her. But well, we do know what a wonderful woman she was and the impact that she had on the local church. You know, I look at what she did. Notice she's full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. If you'll look on down, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. In verse number 39, though, I want to show you. Then Peter rose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. No, of all the things that she did for the people less fortunate in the church, it reminded me over there in the book of Proverbs chapter 31 where we have the description of the virtuous woman. Look at what it says about her. In verse number 20, she stretches out her hand to the poor. That's the virtuous woman whose price is far above rubies. The Bible says that she gave alms deeds. She reacheth forth her hands to the needy. Look at verse number 31. She give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own, there it is, works. Praise her in the gate. She was full of good works. Tabitha is the virtuous woman personified in the book of Acts chapter 9. Now listen, let me make something very clear. She knew that she wasn't saved by her works. But she was saved Four good works. The Bible says over there in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse number 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We've established that we are not saved by our works. But watch this. When God has set us apart, when He has made us His child, notice, we are 
His workmanship. Here's why we've been created in Christ. Unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. We are not saved by good works, but because we're saved, we ought to show forth with good works. Her life was a living example on how a believing lady was to follow Christ and impact the church. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 9 says this, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with the broided hair or with gold or with pearls or costly array. In other words, don't draw attention to yourself, ladies. But which becometh women professing godliness. She's a disciple. Watch this. With good works. She's an example for all the women. Now listen, I ain't saying, ladies, you ought not look good. We'd appreciate that. All the men in the church appreciate when the ladies look good. Amen. But we're, we, and listen, I'm going to say this. Men can be immodest too. Right? You wear or do or say anything that draws attention to you away from the Lord Jesus Christ, that's immodesty. And that can run the gauntlet. What he's saying, you know what's more important than that? Tabitha was an example to the church of what it means to live a godly life and to show it with good works. That is how we ought to be. Last night, I was sitting there listening to my kids play, and all I heard was Abraham say to Maddie, Maddie, I want to be a duck. It's all about context. Amen? So I go walking in, and Maddie had gotten two Pringles together. You ever done that? If you've never done that, it's, it's the thrill of your life. It's amazing. So she's got the, that duck bill, you know, looking like this. It's all about context. Amen? We talk about modesty. It's all about context of what we're talking about. Her life was simply a living example of what it meant to follow Christ with her life and then to show it with outward actions. So she made a lasting impact in the church. We find this, of course, by her walk. We find this by her works. And finally, I want you to see, we find it by her worth. We find it by her worth. Look at verse number 37. We'll finish this paragraph. Look at this. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. And when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. You know, you know what happened when Ananias and Sapphira died? They buried him. Oh, well. See ya. Right? Not her. I find this striking. I, I, maybe I have said that a lot today. This whole paragraph is striking. But I find this so significant that they didn't just go out and do like they did with Ananias and Sapphira. They laid her up. They washed her body. And they put her up in the chamber. Look at this. And for as much as Lida was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent, him un, uh, sent unto him two men. They heard he was there. They sent two men from the church. Please come to our church. Look at this. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And so imagine this in your mind. He walks into this scene, and it's the viewing for this body. And we find Tabitha laying there, and you've got the widows who are mourning for her because of the impact that she had made in their life. And they're like, look at this beautiful garment that she had made for me. Look at these coats. Look at the stitching. Look at the quality. I want you to look at this. That's how much they loved her. So Peter, you know, he's coming in and, and, and he can't even get to the body. They're coming to him and showing him all the wonder, trying to, to show how impressive she was. So there she is and Peter comes. Now up until this point, there's no record in the book of Acts of any of the, the apostles raising anybody from the dead yet. And so... It's an act of faith of this church. You don't think that Tabitha made an impact on them? Amen. Please, Peter, come. Over there in Mark chapter 16, Jesus said you'll be able to raise the dead. We heard you speak in tongues in chapter 2, and that was another sign gift. So by faith, they went and got Peter, and just hoping and praying he can bring her back to them. So when Peter arrives in the upper room where Tabitha Dorcas lay in state, what does he say? He, he sends them all forth. I love this. 
But Peter put them all forth, everybody out. And he kneeled down and he prayed. Look at this, verse 40. And turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. Wow. The Bible says she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Ooh. And he gave, I know I'm a Gentile, but boy, that's really cool right there. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And look at verse 42. And it was known throughout all Joppa. You don't think she made a lasting impact on people? The whole city was rocked by that. Wow. She sat up. And her. Now her, their much-loved Tabitha was alive again. I find that so significant once again. Because the Lord allowed this miracle to happen. Because He knew how important Tabitha was on earth. Whoa. It reminds me of what Paul said. There in Philippians chapter 1. Let's look at it. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse number 21. For to me, to live is Christ. I'm going to give my life for Jesus. And to die is, is gain for me because I'll be in his presence. I'll be in the third heaven. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. What a great promise, by the way, of Scripture that is. The instant you depart here, you're with Christ. Now, I know we've got a lot of great songs that we talk great gospel songs, but that, that gospel song that says, listen, uh, you know, I saw Abraham, Isaac, Mark, Timothy. I saw everybody. That's all great and good, right? And then he cries out, but I said, I want to see Jesus. That's, that's great. And I know it's impactful. That's not really what the Bible says. To depart is to be with Christ. You ain't got to ask anybody, hey, where's Jesus? You don't have to do that in the third heaven. Y'all with me? And I know, I know that's not what that song means, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to part and to be with Christ, which is... Far better. But look at verse number 24. I think Tabitha knew this because God allowed her to come back. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. How would you like for the Lord to know that you're so valuable to the local church that is His body, He allowed you to come back from the dead so that you can minister? When I look at this story of the raising of Tabitha, I'm reminded of, of the similarities that we see when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead over there in Mark chapter 5 that we studied. In both cases, the mourning people were sent out of the room. In both cases, the words that were spoken, if you look, are almost identical. Tabitha, arise. Jesus said, Talitha, kumi. Isn't that funny? Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. The similarities are amazing. Jesus took the girl by the hand and she lifted up. Why is that important? Because a Jew could not defile himself by touching a dead body. Not allowed to. But she wasn't dead anymore. <laughs> and so Peter takes Tabitha by the hand because her life was returned to her. That's an amazing thing right there. And then the Bible says, so she came back. Now, I don't know if Tabitha appreciated that very much. When Paul saw the third heaven, for the rest of his life, he tried to get himself killed. <laughs> Amen. I mean, who... Who renders to Caesar? Who, who calls for Caesar to try his case when he knew that Nero was a wicked, godless Satan worshiper? Because he knew he'd be in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says here that, that Tabith comes back, and what does she do? Well, she has an immediate impact, again, on the church. 
And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Not only that, look at the next verse. And it came to pass that he, Peter, tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Look at these events. The raising of Dorcas from the dead obviously attracted great attention and resulted in many people trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. And many believed in the Lord. Her impact was not only in this life, but when she was in heaven, she returned to earth. The Bible says that she still was having an impact on people. See, today, if something like that we claim to have, everybody would doubt it. Tabitha, knowing who she was, the Bible says it affected the entire world city, didn't it? During the many days that, that Peter was there, notice Simon a Tanner. He's going to be affected by Peter who would have never been in Joppa in the first place. Had Peter not been in Joppa, see God brought Peter there so that he would give him this great vision of the gospel going to the Gentiles by a great sheet coming down from heaven and having unclean animals in it and God telling Peter, arise P Peter, slay, kill and eat. And of course Peter in his way argues with God and says, not so Lord, I, I can't eat anything unclean. And God said, what I have called clean, you can't call unclean. That great vision of the gospel going to we Gentile unclean dogs, amen, happened here in Joppa. He would have never been in Joppa had it not been for Tabitha. God used this woman to impact generations and believe it or not, us today. Wow. Her life was a living impact. Her worth her resurrection comforted the church. That was exciting times. He presented her to the saints and widows. How'd you like to be outside that room? Remember, you, and you've got her coat in your hand. That's all that you've got left of her in your mind. And then to, to see that door open. And I don't know if Tab Tabitha came first or Peter. Imagine them walking through that door. And Tabitha looking at everybody and them looking at her. Can you imagine the celebration that went on in that church? Wow. The question is this. If we want to know if our life has an abiding impact on the church, then you've got to ask yourself this question. Would your ministry be missed? Would people grieve over you if you weren't here? You've got to ask yourself that question. Would anybody even realize you were gone? In the first place, was there any hole that was left to fill in the ministry by your absence? Oh, I know you don't like that. You've liked everything up until now. Would people show off all the wonderful things you did while you were here? Her walk, her works, her worth all edified the church and allowed the church to impact the city of Joppa. Tabitha, there's nowhere in the scripture that she ever aspired to be anything other than what she was. Just a disciple of the Lord. She made an impact in the church. It's funny, some people are comfortable. They don't want to be missed. They can slip in, slip out. We have folks that leave here, they'll go to a big church because nobody will miss them if they're gone. They'll be able to leave, right? There's some people, it doesn't even occur to me as the pastor sometimes that they've been gone for a month and a half. Why? Because they're not making an impact in the church. They're sitting in a pew. Think of this. Tabitha lived by example. Let me ask you this. <laughs> you're not gonna like this question either. If you're not here, not only would people not miss you, but they'd be glad you're not here. Right? Is it better when your spirit and attitude aren't here? Right? And we laugh every time I leave and go out and preach somewhere, we have record attendances. Amen? So I've already got that in my mind. It's better when I'm not here. Amen? <laughs> but think of that. One person can affect the entire spirit. 
in both extremes. There's some people walk in the door, everybody just lifts up. Whoa, it's party time, you know. Some people, were they even here? What happened? Think of this. Would it be better? God knew that it was better for Tabitha to come back. God also knew it was better for Ananias and Sapphira to just go ahead and leave. The church, notice nobody in the church, in the early church there with Ananias and Sapphira that we learned about a few weeks ago, nobody said, is there an apostle that can raise her from the dead? Raise him from the dead? No, they said, oh, we got to bury him. Oh, he's dead. All right, let's go bury him. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're down, you know. Not Tabitha. She dies. We got to go get an apostle. We got to go get somebody. Maybe they can raise him from the dead. Do you see the difference? See the difference? Can, can the same be said about you that's said about Tabitha? Do you make an impact in your local church? That's the question today. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, we'll end with this. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith and power. Paul's prayer was, you know what that tells me? Every church member has the potential to make the kind of impact that Tabitha made on her local church. Paul said, I pray that every one of you would, would have worth, that you would have a walk, and that you would have works right there in the text. Every one of us today can have the kind of impact as Tabitha Dorcas had. What a great woman to study about today. Are you impactful like Dorcas? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today.